Hello and welcome to episode 6 of The Scumbag. I'm Ed Zitron. I'm Felix Biederman. We are discussing some personal stuff this episode, very personal, to which we refer to, of course, oversharing online, which can go anywhere from your own personal essays about how, like, you were the victim of abuse, but then when you actually read the piece, nothing actually happened. It's just some sort of strange thing. Or to actual revelations about abuse, which are quite educational and teach the world something but mostly they're not like felix i I don't think i'm wrong here mostly they're just masturbatory yeah um personal essays are mostly solipistic and by that i mean that they're written from the perspective that you're the only person in the world who has had this problem or has had any problem uh we're, I would like to get into some of the reasons why personal essays have become such a big thing, why uh, the industry of behaving this way has gotten so big. But, yeah, for the most part, they're fucking worthless. I think, well, for me, it reminds me so much of back when LiveJournal was popular, except people used to make fun of people back then. They used to say, like, Haha, you talked about how a girl didn't like you on your live journal and that's lame but now if someone does that it's considered some deep bearing of the soul and you're some it's, it's always like you're so brave you're just so brave man yeah no there's like nothing like there's nothing really brave about it uh bravery can be a lot of things bravery bravery can be even something you write like there was recently a great uh investigative report in Mother Jones where a guy went undercover as a prison guard. Right. And uh, that was absolutely brave. I don't, I'm not saying that you have to go that far to write something that's brave, but you also can't write something that's like my life with IBS and it's brave (laughs) because that's not the same thing. That's not what that word means. No. And it's always like, and it's, it's really, What's really offensive at the moment is, and we mentioned it when we were talking about kind of the morning episode where we were talking about, oh, yes, when people were talking about their personal depression around the time John Williams killed himself. And John Williams? Um, Robin Williams. John Williams is still alive, to my to my knowledge. This is this is Ed trying to kill <laughs> the, uh, the movie composer John Williams with his violent mind shapes. Well, I, I was going to until I watched Force Awakens, now a riot. But you better fucking watch it, episode eight, all right, John? You're on thin ice. <laughs> Prick. But yeah, no, I mean, we saw we saw the kind of genesis. Well, not genesis, but uh, we saw that kind of thinking when Robin Williams died or when anyone dies, uh, because it's a chance for you to just shit out every part of your internal monologue and go, all right, this has to be worth something. And like, no, it doesn't. Just because it's important to you does not mean it's universally important, but because when these things get monetized, when these oversharing personal essays get monetized in the bubble of media, whether it's San Francisco, New York, uh, or DC, you have a lot of people that were helicopter parented and not told no enough times. And so everything they do becomes the most courageous thing possible. And I think the, if you type in, here's, here's one of the worst things you can do to yourself online, which is exactly why you're listening to this podcast. Type in my letter or open letter medium into Google and you will get some real, just some of the shittiest shit that ever did shit. Now, Talia Jane, when she went out there and she said an open letter to my CEO, the whole the whole Yelp thing, I thought it was pretty brave. I can understand people thinking that, okay, so she was just... Well, I don't understand people saying why she was doing it for fame. This was like the least complimentary thing ever. But I can kind of understand why people kind of were like, Ooh, it's just looking for attention. Yeah. But it's what she wrote was not complimentary either way and it was brave what she said and people claimed it wasn't because like and then they did math on a piece of paper they were like ah, well i did the maths and i spoke to a team of experts and she's actually a huge bitch but the the reason that this was actually brave was because she stepped up and she said in a culture in silicon valley that will gladly fucking eat you alive for writing this she probably well she might have got some fame she probably got 
turned the fuck down from several jobs. Like, she stepped out and said shit. But most people do, like, an open letter to my mum who didn't speak to me until the age of 12 or some fucking shit. I don't know. My favorite, my favorite are the uh, open letters to, like, just a barely specified group of people. Well, if you go, if you type medium my letter in, there's literally one that just says an open letter to you. And it's from Talia Jane. I'm sure it's fine. But it's just that title alone was just... I was, I was actually quite disappointed to see it was Talia Jane who actually writes things that are worth reading. Just not not like something which is just openly masturbatory and sad. In open, le- like open letters, usually, like, uh, people start doing them in political writing because I guess you can just, you can take a fucking hepatitis shit on a, on a Word document now and someone will pay you to run it. Yeah. But uh, people are now writing open letters to candidates, which is just amazing for so many reasons. Like... A that that that, that like a, any any politician, whether they're venal or corrupt and corrupt or well meaning and honestly intentioned, would read a letter from an opinion columnist. Which, sorry, a, opinion writing is the easiest fucking thing you can do. It's the easiest kind of writing. Yeah. Once we like develop AIs that can go, well, I liked candidate X until. Then thousands of people will be out of work. But anyway, uh, those are good because they're very they're grossly personal. Yeah. <laughs> it's like it. I've been jacking off into the back page of a newspaper for twenty years, just my dumb shit, middling opinions. But uh, all right, Secretary Clinton or Senator Sanders or uh, fucking uh, Governor Perry. Uh, as equals, here's what I think. <laughs> and it just, like, just the presumed importance of that. Combined with, like, there is nothing in an open letter that couldn't be stated in just a declarative essay. The only reason you would do it is if you are the type of person that puts your hands on your hips at a movie theater and goes, all right, how about everybody get into a single file line? You're just a huffy, annoying type of fucking person if you use that as a literary device. Uh, it's true. Though. I don't care. I don't care if if say, I don't. I won't read anything in open letter format. If there was an article that was like open letter to Felix Biederman, your grandmother was actually the heir to a fucking German shipping fortune, <laughs> and here's a billion dollars. I would throw it out. <laughs> On principle, you would be. You would just lose that fucking money just out of spite. Yeah. And it's America. You can make a billion dollars anyway, baby. Yeah. You got to fail to succeed. And I just, just because I truly hate myself, I really want to relive one writer that I actually used to really like who I just find fucking insufferable now. A guy called James Altucia. He is a former hedge fund manager, I think. Something in finance. And his whole shtick when he started, and I was there relatively early on, used to be he'd, be, he'd bear his soul about basically his divorce and all this other shit. And it used to be quite revelatory. It used to be really interesting because you'd be like, oh, wow, this guy's really getting into his failures and what he learned from them. Except he's done like 680 of them now. And it's just like at some point you have to wonder, are, are any of these real stories? Did you just... Because he's definitely a good writer. It's just a question of whether perhaps he embellished them. Most likely he, he embellished them. Like, he was like, oh, I had an apartment above Wall Street. What he actually means is he had an apartment 10 minutes from Wall Street. And he, but then that one was... And it's always some fucking fiery thing with him where it's like, oh, yeah, how getting that apartment helped me fucking save the Wall Street. I don't even know. But the worst thing is... The follow-up to these now countless pieces is open letters to him, such as this one from Blaze Ariznov on Medium. Quality shit, you know it's on Medium. That's very well-maintained, edited posts. An open letter to James Altucher. I'm just gonna just gonna read one excerpt from it. James, I want to give you something. The biggest milestone I ever achieved last year was my trip to Tibet. I'll never be the same again. My 2015 year milestone would be taking the Trans-Siberian Railway. I will probably fail at this one. What the f- Who fucking cares, man? Just who fucking cares? Even if James read this, what's he going to be like? Okay. Thanks Thanks for bearing your fucking life. You, you, you booked a plane ticket. 
you booked a train ticket as well? Yeah, no, yeah, again, it's like oddly personal. There's a lot of investment. There are a lot of people really think that, like, for however many thousands of followers they have, that people really give a shit about their lives. God, no. I, no one who follows me gives a fuck about my life. No one. They don't care about how happy or sad I am. They don't care about my personal triumphs, and I don't want them to. I admit I've fallen into the trap, though. I've written about divorce. I've written about my divorce. And I, but I'll be the first to admit that, though there was always an element of, like, hey, maybe someone will read this and think I'm intelligent. Really, it was just catharsis. Just, like, I just want to kind of vomit. It's like vomiting out alcohol. But these people... Yeah, that's fine. Which is... And that I find some great writing comes from that. I find when you get someone who is just clearly just getting some something out... That's it. And I think that that's where this originally came from. I think it was there were people... I don't know where the genesis of this is. I don't care to look it up because research is against our methods. But holy fuck. It's like people saw that and were like, huh. People seem to be getting attention for these kind of open emotional things. Perhaps I could just needlessly share half of my fucking existence for no good reason. And the embellishment is part of that because... There's like an industrial design. Like, I don't know if you saw this, but there was a thing. There was an open entry th- uh, checkbox that Cosmo was passing around what? a couple of years ago where it was like, uh, check off one of these boxing boxes if you've A, had an eating disorder, B, tried to kill yourself, like shit. Like, like just ghoulish shit. That is. And it's, it's horrible. It causes people to embellish. Like, okay, so a, a big genre of. Uh, Writing in the past few years has been sex worker writing. Yeah. And it's fascinating because I think we're finally experiencing sort of a sea change in how we view that. Obviously, there are massive problems with state violence leveled against sex workers and criminalizing it has clearly been shown that it's, you know, it's sort of a means of societal control. It's the sexist use of state power. Yeah. Obviously. But uh, because there's a personal essay economy, it's caused people sort of lie about their experiences in it. You know, there's this this one woman uh, <laughs> you know, made just lie, by lying by omission or straight up lying also made it sound like she had been a uh, she'd been a prostitute, but really she'd been a cam girl. And look, there's fucking nothing wrong with that. No. I don't begrudge anyone for how they make money uh, but that's just also straight up lying and against the concept of journalism. And I think that uh, the economy that women writers experience is fucking brutal. Yeah. I mean, I I moved to New York a year, not even a year ago, and I've been able to, like, make a living writing exactly what I want to write about. Like, I'm incredibly lucky, but a woman would not be allowed to do what I did because the economy for women writers is that it's exploitative under the guise of empowerment. It's tell us, write about a time you were raped, write about your your eating disorder, write about, uh, you know, about how, like, this guy didn't want to fuck you. Just write these horrible personal events that have happened and we're churning out so much of it. We don't care if these actually happened or not or if you're embellishing. We don't, like, the entire for econ- economy for women writers centers on this personal essay thing. And it's almost like they're editors don't want them to write anything else and it's just it's brutally fucking sexist and cynical and exploitative and it's you know that's why i i can't it's hard to really make fun of these all the time even though we do because it's a sin it's a it's more it's more to blame like the fucking capital owners and the editors and yeah. the middle management who put this shit forward and one of the most telling things to back up what you're saying as well is just going to the toilet of the internet thought catalog and finding the open letters tag woman amanda conda dear rapist i forgive you woman alison mccoy to the woman who took him away from me you made me realize i was better without him woman shan go a mistress is left for her lover's lover every fucking one of these is some woman who is i mean bully for them that they got the they got paid to write, but it's just like you have to wonder how many writing jobs are not given to women because they won't write shit like this. I'm not even saying shit badly. Oh, thousands, thousands, and like, well, okay, like, what well, if you if your only interaction with women was 
through the media. It was through these articles. You would just, you know, you would, you would think that like that this is all they can write about is just horrible shit that happened to them. And the amazing thing is, you'd never really see guys doing these as well. I kind of wish you did. Like, I mean, we talked about that kind of spermless, worthless man last last time. The one with the bad dick and all his Burning Man stuff. But a lot of these male ones are usually from positions of strength or they go into political things or it will be like, if it's not an open letter, because it isn't just the open letter format, it's just the needless oversharing. And sometimes it's an, an, an kind of accidental oversharing, like any under all of the hundreds of ones where it's like some political columnist are like, Ugh, the trolls were on me again. And I peed myself while reading Twitter that day because it just hurt me so much. Well, you know, I think from the, with the male ones, with the male ones, here's the interesting thing that I, you brought up a great point. It comes from a position of power. It's always like, I'm a Wall Street executive, but uh, my dick is inside my body. Like it dogs. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, and it's, uh, it's, a, that they're like, they're, it's sort of like, I see I'm bringing myself down to you, to you, the woman. I'm writing you something that a woman would write. Ugh, and gross. B, it's also like, it's the way that a sociopath receives love from people. The only way a sociopath knows how to receive love from people is through pity. And <laughs> they're, just, they're just trying to glom up pity as they go in this revolting exercise. I'm not saying that they are sociopaths, but they are doing something a sociopath does. So Something sociopathic. And you do see guys sometimes do tweet storms and you know how much and how much you love them. But it's always it's always these fucking with guys. It's always like, you know what? I'm a guy, but hey, I have emotions. Okay? I'm not I'm not made of stone. And it sucks, you know, being a guy sometimes. And I just don't understand it. I don't, I, like, and, and the worst thing is the ones that usually nut up and actually write something personal do so in a way that's so obviously self-promotional. James Altu should be in a great example. I used to think he was this big revelatory guy. He was really just stepping out, really showing his, showing himself. No, he's written like two fucking books and he, and now he's written a load of shit about, oh, his fucking podcast. Now he got that big. And he pretends like it's all like this, these personal secrets. And it's not. It's just that he got famous because he already had a job at HBO. And he kind of told some personal stories about how he fucked around at his job. And again, it's still from fucking power. It's still like, the, if you take away the thin layer of some quasi, maybe fake vulnerability, he's still ultimately saying... I had a really nice job. You know what? Well, I had the privilege of fucking around during it. No, yeah, that's... It, you know what it's like? It's like... This is the evolution of the bourbon bastard writing. Uh -huh. All the bourbon bastard writing comes from this thing like, I had a lot of sex and I feel bad about it. <laughs> and people were still doing this well into about 2011. Uh, there was a guy that a lot of media people who just bitch about the uh, misogynistic trolls all day but happily talk to this fucker, uh, this guy comfortably smug, who's this, like, hedge fund shit dick in New York who lied about, uh, lie, like, caused a public panic during Hurricane Sandy in addition to tons of other horrifying shit. But this fucking moron in about 2008 or nine wrote these diary entries for New York Magazine because I guess after you regularly publish Jonathan Chait, you will just... You know, I could go in there and jack off onto your printer and you guys would run it. I think it's but, more like uh, lead poisoning. Like, you, yeah. you just kind of, it gets in your system enough. You, know, you publish enough chate and it just builds up in your bloodstream and you can only jack off. But this guy would run this and it was sort of like, you could tell how clearly it was embellished because this guy had probably let, read a little Hunter S. Thompson, maybe a little bit of like the Exile journals, maybe a little bit of other gonzo shit. Yeah. Where he's just doing an insane amount of drugs that I know a man of his age cannot well handle. No. And he's like, but it was like, I, 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 I top myself off with cocaine. I think about the girl who blew me in the car yesterday, but then I think about the one, the only one I ever loved. <laughs> Damn it. Damn it. <laughs> and it's it's coming at you this perspective, like, hey, I've got feelings too. You know, I may be a big, powerful Wall Street pit player, but I still feel sad about a breakup. And it's like, you're, you're such a fucking sociopath and a worm 
that the only way that you can think how to be human is just that you're this crazed sex maniac who ha- who just can't let it go. Yeah. Can't like it, let a breakup go. But that's, I mean, that is, that's the bourbon bastard writing. It's, uh, I just have sex because one time I had sex with a woman and I couldn't forget her, but I was too much of a bastard for her. I was too much of a cool bastard. And now I just fill the empty hole with drugs and sex. And it's and a really it's a, cool what a, and using skateboards. Yeah, it's like what a 14 year old thinks is cool. Like, I remember when I saw Casablanca when I was like 14, I thought everybody's telling me it's this classic movie, and Humphrey Bogart just gets drunk and fucks girls the entire movie. Yeah. And, and I was like, I don't get why this is sad. Like, his life is great. And I used to think that was just me being 14 and dumb, but it's, I mean, that's actually correct. What I thought was correct now, I can see it. Just that sort of bullshitty way of thinking. But the thing now to do is that, like, powerful guys, they've internalized the exploitative industry of think piece writing and personal essay writing to where they're like, uh, instead of being, I, I took my good dick out of her bitch vagina and drank my bastard whiskey. And it was Damn good it. whiskey. I was never, never going to love again as I drink that good whiskey. But now they've read personal essays that people have reacted hugely to. And now they're like, uh, I also have depression. And it's just, it just like it's just like the most cynical shit. But it's just like they're they're evolving it. It's like in Spinal Tap when it showed them shifting genres to try to catch up with shit. Like when they were country musicians, it's the same shit. It's the exact same shit. And it's it, it really is actually remarkably sim. And I'm going to admit, there's not actually much as as far as the kind of personal essay thing goes. There's not actually much from guys, and that's that's really something that stands out. But what you see guys doing, and you, I don't want to belabor the point because Jezebel did it way better. But remember the whole thing where oh god, it was like. BuzzFeed has, like, four dudes that on video, like, try on dresses or whatever, and, or they, like, they, like, they, they pretended to have a period. Did you ever see this? Yeah. And it was just that, it's, and the worst thing is it's all part of the same thing. It's all, it, it was romanticized by the media just because they, they need something to justify BuzzFeed. I don't know why, I actually don't mind BuzzFeed. I think there's some good reporting going on, and I think the content is pretty benign, and I don't understand White, where people get so mad, except for the tweet things, the things that it's just a stream of tweets that actually personally offends me. But I'm not petty. But when they do these things, Jezebel put it quite well in the, and I paraphrase, that it's just kind of cheapening women's experiences to make men look better. And that's all it is. It's dressing up, it's pretending it's vulnerability, but what it is is just kind of making the guys seem good, like men are good they're good guys and you know what they can be like girls as well or the one where the guy wore makeup for a week that was the fucking worst that one was just like and he was and he was i remember reading through that shit and just being like oh christ almighty because it was like you know what i felt more comfortable about myself but i also felt so judged and it's just like no it's because you're it's because you're you're deliberately doing something for some sort of attention mate you're not being vulnerable your girlfriend making fun of you or saying you look weird is just it's just cuz you probably put on makeup which guys don't classically do it's uh you know what it reminds me of uh <laughs> when Arthur Chu said um oh fuck uh, yes Arthur Chu is the best my discomfort as a straight man watching gay porn is what women feel all the time. And it just, like, made me think of him jacking off to gay porn and being like, I hate this, right? <laughs> this is the only way I can empathize with women. <laughs> but, but it's... No, it's, like, the same thing. It's, like, it's supposed to be... You know, it's under the guise of, I'm living your experience, and you're right, ladies, you have it bad. But really, it's just, like, I'm look how great I am. I'm voluntarily relinquishing my power as a man for exactly one week. And... It's amazing as well because th- that Arthur Chu thing, and I admit to not seeing this at the time because I think the universe, I'd done something wrong that day. So the universe was like, nope, one bad, one good thing has happened that you can laugh at and you're not going to see it that day. But I found it now. And it's, I try to remember as a straight dude that the discomfort I feel at gay porn sites is how women online are made to feel most of the time. So 
wait. Okay, just... This is great because... And it's a great bridge into wokeness. And wokeness is just another form of fake vulnerability and fake oversharing. Because no one really is truly oversharing in these cases. It's like, that was... De- like, d- d- it either did happen... And Arthur Chu sat there, and I love your idea, by the way, that he did sit there and just, like, force himself to jack off. He's like, come on, you fucker. you got to prove how woman... This is for you, ladies. <laughs> Follow Friday, these, these sweet gals. <laughs> Follow these wonderful gals. <laughs> but it's also like... Wait, so... Like, all right, so I personally find penises disgusting. So is that how women online are made to feel most of the time? Like, the... I mean, I'm trying to wrap my head around what he was saying because he probably typed this out and, like, heard Land of Hope and Glory behind him. It's like, duh, 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 duh. I'm such a fucking great guy. And his justifications were even better. Like, it's over-the-top sexuality that I'm not into at the time. Don't want to be involved with. Okay, more salient. And he obviously deleted this tweet because everyone was like, ha you fucking prick, you dipshit. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you feel yeah, you asshole, but it's like uh, you know, uh, in the past five years, something weird has happened where all the guys who would be on 4chan a few years ago or uh, playing uh, competitive Counter Strike, guys who know all about swords and shit, yeah, uh, they just became male feminists somehow. Like for for some reason, they all became male feminists and. Uh, They've taken their same RPG view of the world and applied it to feminism. It's beautiful. Where they're like, "Oh, I'm on this week. I'm on Woman Quest, and I have to, <laughs> I have to pick up the item makeup, and then I gain <laughs> plus three experience as a woman, and that translate that's transmutable to plus three in my empathy points." Huh, I put my horny level is full. I must acquire three plus plus three woman respect. <laughs> yeah. And once I have enough woman respect, I can lower my horny level, which will eventually kill me. And it's just, it, it's true, though. And the, the male feminist things, and the, the horrible thing is, it's actually quite evil when you really think about these guys who are like that. Because there are some dudes who would just straight up like, you know what, we need to have more respect for women. And I respect some of them, kind of. But also, like, I just don't know how I would identify one that was particularly sincere because just the moment that a guy steps out and says, you need to spend more time respecting women, and here's a big article I wrote on that subject, or here's some tweets about my experience, it just, it's it stopped being about woman the moment the guy spoke. And it's, they're acting like it's some grand opening into their soul, like they're finally getting it off their chest that they respect woman. Like, it, like, that's a fucking... Like, they should get a medal. And then there are, of course, the guys who respond with exactly... It's like, you don't deserve a medal just because you respect women. It's just... It's this horrifying thing of just desperation. And I really think your, your point's salient when you say, all right, yeah, it's just like I have plus 100 horny and the only... I must have more sex points. There is a type of... There's a type of assumptiveness... That comes with that type of person. I love, you know, there's, this is a subgenre of that type of guy, but the guy who's like, who was racist until they were about 28. Yeah. And they're like, holy shit, I'm done with it. I'm fucking done with racism. It's stupid. Fuck racism. But they think everyone was also stupid until they were 28. And they just make their mission to tell people what they can and cannot say. Yeah. And just find racism, even like, even in places where it isn't, when there's just no shortage of it in the real world. There's no shortage. You don't have to fucking make it up like these guys do. But, yeah, they bring that... Nerds can't like something in the way that normal people do. Like, I see this with MMA all the time. Like, MMA people, like, they'll they'll find anyone who ever criticizes MMA, like, any just minor celebrity, and be like, what a fucking asshole, we need to kill him. <laughs> We'll never get respected as a mainstream so- sport unless we kill this guy. And it's like, I don't give a shit. If, if if someone thinks MMA is stupid, I don't fucking care. I like it. I don't give a shit. Surely if you're confident in liking something, you wouldn't. I can understand if someone's just horribly wrong about something and you for some reason know them well enough to correct them. But it's these people who are like, you know what? 
I like. I feel like it might be that they're liking something for a reason versus actually liking it, and they must defend it so that they defend themselves. There's a part. There's a part of being a nerd where your your personal preferences become your being. And this is, I think this is extended now more to everyone is like this. Everyone, most, not most people, but like most media people think this. They think that their choices in media and consumption define who they are as people. Yeah. But if you like something that's kind of fringe, like MMA or whatever, you think that any assault on MMA is, or MMA or like comic books or fucking whatever is an assault on you as a person when really it's not. But then they'll, you know, and yeah, MMA is frivolous and weird and fucked up in a lot of ways, but yeah, I don't give a shit if someone thinks less of it. Now, obviously this is not analogous to anti-racism or feminism, et cetera, because they just hold massively different social values. Uh, But they apply that same... You know, no, but at the same time, no nerd has ever convinced them that someone to respect whatever it is they like through their shitty personalities. And they're not going to do it here in something that actually has a lot of societal value. And my favorite one, if you take it a step back, is the one that you and I kind of make fun of quite a lot, which is, and I, and I, I preface this by saying there are some people who are very, very protective of their gender or their non-specific gender, and I respect the right to do that. But I feel like every third Twitter account I go on is like he, it, she, him, ENFP, politics, Bernie bros stay out, my dog stole my homework, but my homework was fascist, like something like that. And it's all like a list of their personal, that what they're pretending are like their personal truths and like their deep feelings, but really they're just surface level, especially because the whole ENFP thing and just... All of these fucking personality traits from Myers-Briggs are complete garbage. Yeah, they're total bullshit because, like, they're all complimentary. Like, if you read the description for all of them, they're like, you're outgoing, you like to, uh, you like to make people feel welcome, or you're introspective, you, 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 when you talk, it means something. And, like, I know for a fact that most people aren't that good. No. If you really wanted to do that accurately, you would have in your bio, like, uh, I'm an R A A P. I'm a rude, <laughs> annoying asshole prick. Uh, my traits are that I shout all the time. I'm wrong about everything. Typically, one of my nuts will be hanging out of my button fly because I just didn't care to do it the right way. Uh, yeah, I'm a racist. Int- I'm a racist extrovert. <laughs> like, <laughs> like that's if you really wanted to do it accurately, but you don't. Like people don't. I because- really want to change my profile to something like super honest, like. I don't sleep enough. I drink way too much Diet Coke. I definitely should lose some weight. My career is kind of stupid, but at least it makes me money. Email me here. What would I, I guess mine would be like, uh, I either don't sleep at all or I'll sleep 13 hours and wake <laughs> up like at two like a piece of shit. <laughs> it's, uh, it's true, though. Yeah. Uh, I I write about things that a child likes. Like I, I, I write about grown men fighting each other, uh, and then just talk shit with my friends for my other job. Um, I like I'm a poor time manager, and whenever I can't find a mundane item before going to the gym, I'll uh, I would say things that would get you fired from any <laughs> network TV position. <laughs> Just to myself, like psychotically. I I get so upset when I c- can't find my keys that I want to detonate a bomb under my car. Do you ever have that? Do you ever have that where like you you're not suicidal at all, but like something is so inconvenient, you're like, you know what? If I had the chance to die right now, I would take it. If it was painless. <laughs> like, yeah. like, what, what, like the other day, I was go I was going to the gym and I I think I forgot like a change of socks and I had already gotten two blocks from my apartment. And like at that moment, if you if you were like, all right, you could either go back to your apartment, go to the gym, and not have a change of socks or die, I'd be like, see, I'm going to see. I would like to die right now, please. And uh, yeah, my version of that was like just before this podcast, I left my microphone at home, and I was like unable to get the microphone here working. 
And it was, it's a nice microphone, I'm going to sell it. But I was like, you know what, I might just fucking smash it, because that's what it deserves. Because that's a normal reaction that people have. That's bearing one's soul, and bearing one's soul is actually pretty fucking boring. Yeah, it's, it, because it's our most mundane moments and our most psychotic reactions to mundane events. Uh, well, the reason that I don't believe a lot of fucking personal essays is because people's thought paths are too linear. Yeah. And it doesn't work like that. It's, I, I love it. I would love it if my mind went in a straight fucking line like this, like, I have anxiety, but then I feel better. So I go and do something, ah, but I'm depressed again. So I go and sit and I be depressed. No, it's like, it's just like a mess, like a big soup that someone shit in. When I wake up and I have anxiety about something, like I have anxiety about existential things or like, oh God, well, I think I make this amount of money now, but what if this happens? Yeah. Do I have enough saved? Ah, uh, I think this girl nine years ago wanted to fuck me. I didn't notice, but like, would she? If I talked to her now, would she? Uh, hey, uh, uh, I think I have a foot rash. Uh, <laughs> uh, oh man, what happens after we die? Yeah. Uh, Got to respond to these emails. Like that, that's what it's actually. It just fucking stupid. Like if people knew my internal monologue, there would be a public vote to murder me. I think it would be the same with me as well. It would be like I'm falling asleep, and I'm like, ah. Uh, yeah, God, well, I mean, I have a good life, but, you know, what if everything just goes horribly fucking wrong tomorrow? I get all the clients leave, and I, like, have to fire every member of staff, and I lose my house, and I, like, go home, and my parents are dead somehow. Oh, man, I wonder if I have enough Diet Coke downstairs. Oh, the cat's over there. Oh, cute kitty. Man, but where was I? Oh, yeah, shit, I better answer these emails. Oh, I hope there's not an email firing me from every client. It's like, it's not linear. It, and I'd love it if one of these things is written like an open letter to the guy who cheated on, sorry, that my girlfriend cheated on me with. And it's just like, you fucking dick shit, motherfucker. Fuck you, asshole. Dickhead. I'm going to, you know what? I'm going to think about beating the shit out of you and violently killing you. But realistically, I'm not going to do anything. You know, that's the, because that's like the real honest reaction to that. If I see you in person, I'm going to get really fucking angry and like, I'm going to like act like I'm going to hit you. But really, I don't actually want to experience pain. Like truthfully, just don't. So like, I'm, I'm probably just going to yell something and I'm going to be genuinely worried you're going to hit me. But, and I'm going to hope that it all blows over. And I'm probably going to leave, but I'm going to pretend I'm leaving because I'm too angry. What I'm actually doing is I just want to go home. In the, like it, when people like they talk when the, they praise personal essays, they go, "This was an unfiltered look at blah blah blah," and uh, like no, it's actually not unfiltered because a, the filter between our minds, our subconscious minds, our conscious minds, and then our verbal expression, it will filter out a lot of things we think are fucking too raw for the world. But it will also just filter out like a bunch of things that don't have any any reason to be in a logical path of thought. And in fil- if I if you were like if someone did an unfiltered interview with me, it would be like I would be talking about how the concept of eternity freaks me out, and then I would be like, well, you know, sometimes I'm afraid I fucked up my dick by jacking off <laughs> with calluses on my hand, and I don't like that. I've been trying to wear a different type of underwear. Then I'd be like. You know, I like reading the Bible, but I wouldn't consider myself religious. Then I'd go, you know, I've seen the movie Payback nine times, but I haven't seen it in probably two years. I'd like to watch it again tonight. Oh, it's already 2 a.m. Okay. That would be unfiltered. What's great as well is this actually happened to me. And this is, this is again, with being honest here, I was super proud when this ran. But when I first read it, I was super upset. But it's actually helped my career immeasurably. So I got interviewed by Newsweek basically for upsetting PR people. And on some level, I did want to, like, help. But really, I did just want to upset them because I was mad. And what's brilliant about this piece is written by this, this fellow, Zach Schoenfeld, is he interviewed me. And I'd been on, a, like, an 11-hour flight from San Francisco to London. And I was on, like, four hours of sleep. I was so tired. And he's like, you pretty much need... He didn't really say it, but it was pretty obvious that if I didn't talk to him, then it would never happen. And it's great because it's like, um, uh... And it's just me rambling like a fucking psychopath. Like, you read it, and I'm surprised anyone reading this thinks, oh, I should hire that guy. He seems, he seems like he's really, uh... He's really got, got a good handle on himself. When really... I just fucking just went off my shit and just rambled like a nutcase. 
just going back and forth, oscillating between subjects, just just like a drunkard. Like a drunkard, like someone found me after seven whiskeys. Like, Ed, uh, what's your view of the PR industry? And I just went, fuck you, know what, fuck them. It's a bunch of tit fuckers and assholes. And I threw my glass at them. Yeah, I I uh I actually I went back and read the first things that I ever got published and I was recapping the show Bastard Executioner. <sighs> and it's just like replete with horrible spelling and grammatical errors. Oh my god. I don't yes. know why I don't know why I fucked up so bad. Like I want to say that I was nervous, but that's fucking stupid. Like I should have like you don't get nervous and forget how to write. But <laughs> It's like it's like I I almost want to give the observer the two hundred and fifty dollars they collectively paid me. I want to give them that money back because it's just it's so rambling and shitty. Well, I wrote this medium post yesterday about a subject that is irrelevant to this one. It's about some some things a tech person did, but I remember see, reading it and being like, "Huh, this is full of fucking typos." I mean, like egregious ones. Like I meant to write inevitably. I think I just wrote inevitable. And it was just like fucking what, clap, clap, clap head. It wasn't even like I wrote it late. It was like 12 noon on a Sunday. I'd had my coffee. And it was just, it just, just fucked up, just blew it. And I like that at least. And Pizzo was like, you made tapers. I mean, you really didn't put much effort in. He's like, no, I just didn't fucking notice because my brain doesn't work. Yeah, sometimes you just fuck up. Yeah. And you Regularly. could say, you could say that it's hypocritical because part of my job one of one of my occupations is to annotate things for genius. Yeah, and just viciously make fun of people who will, in one instance, write poorly. But my response is like, "Fuck you!" Like I, I, uh, um, you know that yeah, it's hypocritical. Everyone's a hypocrite, and I like that extra hundred dollars a week. I can now order from the Grubhub delivery when it's a fifteen dollar minimum. Yeah. That's that is an upgrade, and but this one this one oversharing thing that's really fucking gets me. And I and I have anxiety. I have depression. I have them. Um, my anxiety is fucking terrible. It's like having like a rat in your brain. It's like shut the fuck up. It just like any good idea I have is bad. But I keep going because whatever. Like what am I meant to do? Just sit here. But it's like and I'm gonna talk about Mike Sacco here. I just I'm gonna fucking do it. I'm tired of the fucking guy. And like he's a nice fella. I've given him a lot of money. I don't care. And he, like, wrote the other day after deleting, like, every tweet response to everyone. He wrote, like, it's tough being a person with feelings. And it's like, fucking hell, man. Yes, of course it's fucking difficult. But not everyone gets, like, three, four, five grand from the internet to help you move to fucking Texas. And I don't want to, like, beat up the guy because he's, like, muscly now and can totally beat me up. But, like... It's yeah, he's 5% Mike. He's Mike Piana now. <laughs> All right. That's that's uh, Mike as Rich Piana. 95% of men don't get jobs in the games industry. <laughs> I'm oh, Ed. I'm sorry, everyone. <laughs> I'm not trying to Ed. remove it. But no, it, but it, he's Do not... Do better. <laughs> I, I'm not going to. I, he's, okay. He, I'm going to get a lot of shit. I don't care. But so it's... Not really him per se, but he, that's just a good example of just when people are like, I just want to talk about my anxiety. It's like, no, you want people to make you feel better about your anxiety. And I actually, as stupid as it sounds, when someone's just like, I just want some attention or I just want, you know, I'm feeling really anxious. Someone tell me something nice. At first, I kind of roll my eyes, but at the same time, I'm like, you know what? Fuck it. Thank you for at least being honest about it. When someone's like, let's talk about my introversion. Let's talk about my anxiety. I'm getting so fucking tired of this, like, romanticism about depression, anxiety, introversion, extroversion, whatever. It, in a vision, the song by System of a Down. I don't fucking know. It's like every medical condition is like a badge of honor now. Yeah, it's, uh, depression, it kind of, like, it got old hat for people. Yeah. Uh, you could tell that people got bored about writing their depression, so anxiety became the new one. And I guess there's some value to talking about it but, or uh, describing your own experience. But, you know, I, 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 think we've, I think we've done that enough times. I think people fucking get it. And now we're just at the point where uh, it is people's personality. I said something like this once on my old account, and I have ne- 
I have never gotten so many people fucking yelling at me. All the people, all the people that I like uh, told them I was going to like kill them or suck their husband's dicks <laughs> or like uh, pledge allegiance to Bashir al-Assad, like all the other shit I did, people were just like, oh, he's being, that's silly. Yeah, you talked about but, sucking off the baseball crank, but they, yeah, they thought that was just, normal. Yeah, they're like, okay, that's fine. <laughs> Wants to suck the screaming baseball head to completion. But uh, no one ever got mad at me when I was like, and I like, I, I clarified, I go, yeah, anxiety is obviously a legitimate condition, but people talk about it like it is their personality. And just, I think that's not a fucking constructive way to talk about it. And if you do that, you're a dull person and you fucking suck. And and this is, I'm so sorry. I'm not really that sorry. I, I'm not, don't even know why I said that. I'm just, if you need to keep talking about it, and I understand if you don't have a therapist, you have no friends anywhere, then maybe you talk about it publicly all the time. What well, I don't fucking understand is like the people who are like every two minutes, they're like, I'm crying. I have depression. I have depression. It's depressing. And it's just, I'm sorry you feel like that, but past a certain point, I have to wonder what's going on. And what's horrible is, just like the rest of the things we're talking about, there are some people with legitimate problems here who have nowhere else to go, who are just screaming for help. And then there's, like, this fucking flood of fucking people who are just like, well, my anxiety really holds me back from my my, uh, my $75,000 social media job. And it's like, oh, fuck you, man. Like, I understand that that doesn't invalidate that you have anxiety, but you, just what, what... Are you talking about anxiety in a way that actually exists? Because my experience of it is it's not actually that easy to describe, and it's just a constant feeling. It's not actually that easy to put into words, and I don't know why I'd want to fucking talk about it that much. It's not fun. I don't enjoy talking about it. I talk to my shrink, and I'm like, oh, I don't want to fucking do this. Yeah, yeah, there's something. Someone who's that ready to talk about it all the time, it feels like they're they're embellishing some of it. And also, you know what? I think caring or the way that people talk about it in this way, like it's a very, it's a very fucking you. you it's something you can only do when you are of a stratified income or experience. Uh, you know, people who. People who live in high high poverty areas uh, like in Englewood and Chicago or uh, some of the pockets around the far north side or th these individual places have poverty rates of 50% or even higher. These rates that we usually, this level of income inequality in an American city that we would usually expect to see somewhere like Mexico City or Brazil, uh, they have incredible rates of PTSD and anxiety and depression because their entire existence is degradation and terror and just existential fear and anxiety yeah. and death and sickness and no hope for mobility. But the way that these people talk about it, they talk, the, the internet people or the media people, they talk it, they talk about it purely in terms of social engagement yeah, and purely in terms of work productivity at a job that frankly isn't that important. But to jack yourself off as courageous or, or like, oh, I'm finally talking about it. When you experience this affliction in the most, the least affecting way possible. And I know people like to say, well, you can't tell somebody what they experience. Yes, I can. I just yes, did. I can because what you experience compared to other people, other people who live in different demogra demographics, who haven't won the lottery in the way you have, they have objectively a worse experience with this. Fuck you. This is this is just solipistic. You're just you're jacking off. If you want to do that, great, but don't pretend it's something it's not. It's like Ed said. It's fucking live journal. And on and you know what. I, how many of these people just think of even middle, lower middle class people? How many of them have fucking anxiety and they just don't talk about it because they have bigger fucking problems? They're probably anxious about 
illogical and logical things like paying bills and they probably have all of these same conditions but they have bigger fucking problems such so they don't have the time or the inclination to go up oh, shit back on twitter and talk about this they, they have i don't want to be so tricely they have real problems but they they're not saying shit like i'm an introvert this is what living out loud means to me it's like fuck, fuck, it's probably fucking people who are making like nine dollars an hour barely making rent in even shitty places who are introverts who just deal with it because they have to and when you don't have to deal with it i guess that's when you talk about it yeah when you can opt out but you still complain about opting out uh the a sort of culture war thing that existed in the 80s and 90s with the rise of talk therapy which you know for acute anxiety and acute depression problems different types of talk therapy has been shown to be more effective than what most people do. But uh, a culture war thing would be, you know, conservatives would go, oh, do you think somebody in fucking Africa is depressed? And, uh, I mean, that's stupid because it, anyone who's saying that, anyone who's extrapolating to a larger issue going like, oh, how do you think people in this place feel? Well, they don't give a shit about those people anyway, so they don't really don't care. It doesn't mean anything when they say it. Uh, but they accidentally stumbled on something where I think more and more we're discovering this to be true, where a lot of depression is just once you've com- once you no longer deal with the uh, fight for food, the fight for survival, the fight for shelter you confront your own existential dread you confront you confront your lack of meaning or what you perceive as your lack of meaning and i think that's a lot of what first world depression and anxiety is at the core of it that doesn't make it invalid but i think uh there's a there's a larger there's a larger philosophical bent to it that you can take and the, the the opposite thing the opposite thing you can do is the uh, the most counterproductive thing you can do is is make that your meaning. It's completely circular to make to make you living your mundane life in the face of well, in most of the cases of these essays, completely exaggerated symptoms. Uh, is you're just you're biding time until the next time that you're confronted with your own fear of a lack of meaning. That's a really good time to bring in when people attach themselves to issues and overshare. When they start, they overshare by overcaring. And I think my shit of the week is one of the best examples we've ever fucking seen. And we could do an entire episode on Zenny Jardin. Because I don't think I've ever seen something more, I think, so up its own ass. It's actually created a perpetual energy loop of... Why Muslims around the world made my tweet go viral. So her tweet, by the way, was, Dude, ISIS... No no punctuation, by the way. Dude, ISIS is bombing Muslim people in Muslim co- communities during the Muslim holy month of Ramadan. How is ISIS Muslim? They're no, no, they're psychopaths. Um, all right, well, I mean, you can deconstruct that tweet in a minute. What, like, that tweet alone was just, you know what? I'm fine with it. It's kind of fine, I guess. And, you know, I can imagine someone banging that out in anger... And just being like, fucking, the world is just... I c- I've been frustrated at the world. You've been frustrated at the world. I get it. If you truly care, and again, I do question if some of these people, don't even know if I'm talking about Zenny here, truly care about these issues that much, or whether they just jump on them to seem like they think about them when they really don't, and they're a fuckload more self- self-serving and two-dimensional. But her endless empty worthless fucking guardian piece about this was what really sickened me. Why Muslims around the world made my tweet go viral is such a despicable thing because it's... You don't know fucking shit about why they made... They probably... I would I would love to... I will pay $150 to the social media person who can break down the 60,000 retweets and show me Muslim or... Okay, no, you can't prove it, actually, so fuck it. I don't know. But I would put money on the virality of this tweet probably not being totally centered around the Muslim world. 
I reckon it was probably retweeted by a great deal of white people who want to pretend like they care. And and she was saying, I was flooded with an innumerable I um, no, an innumerable I love yous. No, sorry, with innumerable I love yous. Sorry, the prose is just so thick, it's killing me. From Bahrain to Beirut to Baghdad. <sighs> Sent by millennial woman in hijab. Oh, Jesus Christ, you had to say millennial, didn't you? And, or men in kanjura, the traditional headdress of men in the Emirates. Oh my God, we get it, you know you know something about the Middle East. And of course, followed by several Muslim respondents replied with a classic Steve Carell gif from The Office. Ah, uh, uh, yeah. This, yeah, I just, I don't even fucking know anymore, man. Like, this is the shit that depresses me more than anything. It's depressing because it, this is this is the most selfish way to look at it. Yeah. Uh, uh, her sentiment, the exact words that she said that, uh, you know, it's been an explored topic. A lot of people who attach themselves to ISIS or violent Salafism at large are actually not great scholars of uh, Islamic scripture and the Quran or the Hadith. You know, we know this is an established thing. They're just... They have an authoritarian personality, or in the case of a lot of foreign fighters, or they, they're, they're uh, irredentists for Sunni domination of uh, parts of Iraq, as we see with more people native to ISIS in Iraq. Uh, but it is not as much to do with religion. People have been saying this forever. Uh, yeah. Shia Muslims, in particular, have been saying this for a very, very long time. Uh, but... I guess just uh, a white woman with a lot of followers saying it just makes it the biggest moment that's ever happened. And she did the thing that, you know, we both love, which is people retweeting compliments. I love people retweeting compliments about their articles, but I really love people retweeting compliments about a tweet. I really like people retweeting compliments about the book that they just released personally. That's my big thing at the moment. I really, that's my my best shit. But my actual favorite shit ever is the subheadline of this article. By pushing back against the idea that ISIS represent Islam, I earn the gratitude of thousands of Twitter users who've grown used to abuse from non Muslims. So fucking stop for a second there. No. I, no. I 100% disagree. I bet she made that tweet. And this is fair. This is fine that she did it like this. I bet she probably did it, like I said, out of just being like the world's fucking shitty motherfucking just good. Like we talk about Linear Thor. Like this was not like she sat down, like cracked her knuckles, like that's fucking it. I'm taking on ISIS. That's it. Fucking yeah. I, I, ISIS, listen up. All right, ISIS. That's it. I've, 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 I've been saying it. I've kept my mouth shut. But ISIS, you and you and me outside. It's like no, you fucking. You probably, in fairness, as a human, this is a perfectly good re, like. Reaction, just like you know what? It's the fucking Muslim home month. Why are you blowing up shit? You're a fucking psychopath. It's just that fine. And like you've said, it's an already dumb point. But that's like by pushing back against the idea that ISIS represent Islam. No, you just made a tweet being mad at ISIS. You, could, I would have actually loved this article if she'd just been like, I accidentally spread a good idea. Right. She makes it sound like she purposely went out there to be like, all right, everybody who thinks that uh. Islam is represented by ISIS. Guess what? And you know what? She didn't change anybody's mind when she did that. <laughs> Just because in case you think any that, of you like ISIS. That ISIS yeah, if you think that ISIS, like, by and large, represents Muslims, you're not going to see a tweet from a fucking white woman who lives in San Francisco and be like, all right, I got to rethink this. <laughs> I, th- I, I like that idea that there's someone out there who's like, oh, I was kind of pro ISIS before this, but you know what? I've really reconsidered the thing. And what's great as well is her her general, just judging on the general group of people that, that I see retweet her and the fact she's writing for The Guardian, it's just the fucking internet feedback loop. It really... The, everyone reading this is already, like, on... The, they're, they're anti-ISIS. They're, they realise that Muslim does not mean ISIS. They're, they might not be much more complex than that, I'm not going to lie and say that I can sit there and discuss the many complexities like you can of the Middle East, but I like most people reading this are not being like, fuck, she really got me. It's not like this was published by the Federalist or like fucking Thought Catalog or Fox News put this on and was like, you know what? This woman actually made a good point. Like fucking 
Oh, would any... I can't even think of... Like, it's not like Donald Trump retweeted and went, you know what, I'm actually wrong. Right, yeah, no. It was, it was ever, literally tens of thousands of people who already agreed with it retweeted. And that's it. the worst shit. That's what... And it, it comes down to the same thing. It's all oversharing, except it's oversharing your overcaring, which I hate to say, but it, it's what it is. It's you... And we, we have an entire podcast, I'm sure, in us about cause, cause hunting, but it's what it is. It's just... Look, this woman also yesterday, she did a big thing about how Pokemon Go was some fucking security leak as well. So I guess she's just like a bad idea machine. But fucking hell, like this. And I won't go on much more because I might actually want to like shiv myself. But I'm going to read another part of this. On US social media that night, as news broke of each attack on Islamic targets. No, it's just Target. By the so-called Islamic State, I saw not even a hint of the outcry that followed the attacks in Orlando and San Bernardino, London or Paris. No pray for Baghdad, no Jusweez Saudi Arabia on Western Twitter. No memes unified global grief. Just more fear, racism and dehumanity. No, stop him. I'm stopping because it's fucking wrong. It's just wrong. It's just your small chunk of Twitter, which is not a representation of the world at large, again, must remind you is j- j- like also i i guarantee she judging on the amount of people she follows she follows 5000 people i guarantee she saw tons of fucking retweets the woke blokes of online were probably like whoop woof i better say something otherwise people won't realize that i just only care about isis things when they affect me which is most people most people see what's in front of their fucking face it's actually a human reaction Right. I mean, people people relate to the type of world that they live in. Like, if you feel like you you identify as living in the Grand West, yeah, you're gonna you're going to feel more immediacy towards uh, the Bataclan shootings or uh, the Belgium attacks or whatever. You know, it's not great, but it's sort of it's kind of our nature. And like, yeah, no, people. You know, you you absolutely. You, but you can also be someone who lives in the general West and still care a lot about these attacks just like how people in in the middle east can care about you know mass shootings here or the, you know a lot of a lot of people iran iran offered condolences on 9-11 to america and it's just like it's also the most stupid circular argument because not only is it not true i saw fucking people it was the fifth it was it was it was like a fucking saturday of the fourth of july weekend so probably people weren't online that much but also i saw tons of people being like this is fucking horrible like they did they actually did that but again i could probably sit there and just if i was if i really had that much time on my hands sit there and be like um excuse me a guy got hit by a car in um massachusetts what where's your worry about that um actually in finland a bloke got shot by someone because they had an illegal firearm. Hey, wait, in Wales, a dude shit himself so much he died. Where's your care about shitting oneself so much that they died? You can use that fucking logic in really stupid ways. But also, I don't fucking... like. This is something that actually goes way back as well, thankfully, before Twitter. But people have all but forgotten about those who were brutally killed by the IRA... When Sinn Féin stepped up after the Brexit, I didn't see one fucking tweet being like, um, no one remembers Jerry Adams and all the IRA shit. Nobody? Nope. Anyone? Anyone remember, like, putting nail bombs? People being fucking stabbed, shot, killed, blown up, murdered, disappearing? No one? Like, I could easily use that kind of fucking look. But the fact is, people are getting older and other things are distracting them. The human brain can only pull up shit in a certain order and so in this case people were going yeah fuck this is horrible and in some cases i imagine people just out having their fucking fourth of july weekend and they saw it and it was bad and they don't it's not like are you are you like meant to just go like every time something bad happens and jump on and be like shit gotta respond it's my job it's not your job no no one no one needs you to respond your your care having your punctuality your punctuationless tweet about ramadan is not going to bring back those dead people right because no one it didn't change anybody's mind you just found a lot of people that agree with it 
Like I, whenever like we have an episode of Chapo that does well, I don't think like, oh, we've converted all these people to a worldview. It's no, we found more people that already agreed with this. That's what all media is. You're just you're maximizing the amount of people that already agree with you that can see it and generate money for you. That's really all that that shit is. Yeah, it's it's called having an audience, and it's exactly what and what fucking annoys me as well is like she's not it like all of her. If you scroll down her feed, and I'm, I'm really just, I, she's not the worst person. She's just kind of insufferable. She's just really fucking annoying. She's it's just, just like really everything she does annoying. is retweets of like retweets of other people, and that's generally a sign that you're just trying to attach yourself to a cause or quote unquote personal brand yourself. And it's just like it's the same over oversharing shit. It's like uh, you know what's important to me right now. Bang 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 bang. Bang, 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 bang. I must prove something. Bang, 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 bang. And it's pretending like this is what you think about and talk about in your daily life when, I don't know, I don't know this person, maybe she does. But I probably put 50 solid dollars down that she does not sit down and have a cup of tea or some weed or whatever she drinks or smokes or whatever and says like, hey, um, we need to talk about Black Lives Matter. And that's it. Like, I can imagine someone, as many people do, going, fucking hell, just see what happened. But not like she, the, the image she creates and many people create is this crazy thing where, like, their entire life is jumping from one thing to the other and how much they care. And they're a care haver. And they're a care doer now because they've got all the retweets. Um, I mean, I don't see, like, boing boing, like, having, like, an Islam section and maybe. Lifting, like, listing a bunch of things that tech does that's anti-Muslim. I mean, they do have the uh, 10 iconic photos from a week of protests throughout the U- U.S. for Black Lives Matter. Shit, guess they forgot about that um, thing that happened six days ago that was super important to Zenny. Because those people are still dead and ISIS, I, I don't think ISIS shut down, did they? No, they're st- still up and running. They still got a bunch of franchises. But, uh, but but wait, but wait. The same website also has weird stuff on the internet. Thanks, fuck. <laughs> like, come on. <laughs> no, I'm, no I'm way. I'm glad they're consistent with terrorist yeah. groups. <laughs> but I mean, hey, look, if you want to talk about uh, if, uh, causes of ISIS or uh, Salafism, uh, none of these people seem to be all that mad of something we talked about, Uber, Uber receiving a massive buy-in from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia who... Funded so many Salafist groups, they've caught more body than fucking cigarettes throughout the world. <laughs> that shit disappeared, like, fucking instantly. And they, I'm sure, I bet if you look on Boing Boing right now, there's probably some sort of fucking article that was vaguely angry about it. Like, it was like, Uber and Saudi Arabia, and I know they're bad, and Saudi Arabia bad, but Uber also bad. Anyway, whoa, holy shit, is that an internet-connected dildo? Yeah, I mean, and like, fine, yeah. If you want to make money off of clickbait and stupid shit, yeah, fuck yeah. No, I, I don't begrudge anyone, anyone, any way that anyone makes money. But when you write an article in the Guardian that goes, it's basically telling people how you save the Muslim world. Ah, <laughs> oh, go fuck yourself, seriously. <laughs> Sorry, I just I'm laughing at the idea because that's definitely like for one one moment, and I bet she probably thought it and then immediately felt guilty. But it's like, I can imagine this woman's like, I really did something for the Muslim world today. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, do you have a shit of the week? Do you, I do. I do. Uh, this is this is kind of out of left field, but I just I saw, it, I saw it popping around. And it was just so shitty that I had to I had to talk about it. <laughs> Starts out strong. Its title is It's in the Star. The Canadian paper, uh, the star, shame on pride and black lives matter. Oh my God. After being given honorary status, it was shameful of black lives matter to disrupt the parade and for pride for agreeing to its terms (laughs) by Mark Jameson. (laughs) I am proud to live in a country that supports and defends and encourages diversity among individuals. I am proud to live in a country where my prime minister, premier, and mayor walk in the pride parade because they choose to participate and support all Canadians, in all caps. 
I am proud to live in a country where democracy flourishes and the right of free speech exists. All right, it just it just kind of goes on like this, but uh, <laughs> three hundred words later, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, uh, so he this guy is mad that uh, Black Lives Matter was in the Toronto Pride Parade. Uh, he goes historically, Pride has distanced itself from political issues. What? Not pertaining to members of the LGBT community. Uh. Notably, notably wanting to bring political issues in the Middle East into the parade. Why would Pride then recognize BLM in such a matter? Black people who identify in the LGBT community are already represented, just as uh, are there are those of other ethnicities, some of whom are more marginalized in the black community. A lot going on here. Look, I do want to clarify that the guy writing this is a black gay man. But holy shit, this is a bad article. <laughs> this is really fucking bad. First of all, like, when is, when is like, uh, distancing itself from political issues? Uh, I mean, can't it also, can't Pride also, um, like, add things to, I did is there, like, an agenda where, like, they've said, okay, no politics, please? Is it, like, one of those gaming chat rooms? Yeah, like, oh, go to the go to the off-topic forum. <laughs> Sega, Sega 822, if you want to argue about the Iraq war, you have to go to the off-topic. You are in, you are in the Halo Mega thread. This is the Genesis 32X thread, not the Black Lives Matter thread. Please go keep... to the off-topic Black Lives Matter thread <laughs> now. <laughs> you will be, you will be suspended for a day. Oh, uh, do not make me put you on probation. <laughs> It's just, and what's great is I went and I actually just Googled just a random, random picture that was actually from the Star Observer. And I'm looking at it and it's saying they're pretty well, they're pretty representative of all races. But all I can actually see is like white guy, white guy, Indian, one Asian. That's not a representative sample. By your logic, you've proven my point. Right, no, it's insanely white. Like, I, I, wow, okay, that, that makes a lot of fucking sense that they would want to be represented. It's, like, it's, uh, I hear black people are also minorities. Did you hear that? I think it's true. Yeah, no, that's a, it's a big, <laughs> big factor of being a minority. I hear that's an issue in the news at the moment. Is being underrepresented. Yeah, it's like they need more representation so they stop being fucking shot and killed and, like, treated worse than other races. Maybe. Like, I think that, that it's maybe a thing. I haven't seen much in the news. This guy, the guy is also mad uh, because he, he's saying that it it's rude to the police who are allowing Pride to be safe. And he also says, shame on Black Lives Matter for disrupting Pride for its own agenda. First of all, guys, I'm not sure. I don't think anyone in the crowd was like, wait, Black Lives Matter? What's going on? What is this parade? Oh, I, didn't, I didn't sign up for this. <laughs> well, well, no, but I like I like that sentence as well because it suggests that somehow someone watching it would be like, wait, wait, what am I watching now? Shit. I, will, I, I don't care about watch... gay people anymore. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I like I ran out of my care meter for the day. Sorry, the black pe- <laughs> the black people are getting it today. Sorry, gays. I know this was supposed to be your day, but tough luck. <laughs> you got you just rolled snake eyes. <laughs> It's, it's true though it's and i mean is is i guess and this is one of my favorite things as well where it's like okay i'm worried about as a person me personally i'd be worried about talking about this on my twitter account because of the and it's a very specific thing he said i'm proud to be a gay black man in canada that immediately is a defense against like 90 percent of criticism because it's like, and he's a self-employed small businessman in downtown Toronto as well. So immediately, like, saying anything bad about this is scary. I'm not afraid. I don't care. I don't care about Mark Jameson. I don't care about his small business, his <laughs> shitty article store. <laughs> and it's Fuck great. him. And it immediately made me think of another thing, not to hijack your thing. The thing about it was like Pokemon Go is an immediate death sentence for black people. That was a weird one. <laughs> that one was like, what? Wait, what? <laughs> because it wasn't like that one was just very short, very in short. You'll find it in the post, but it's that one was just like, 
it made sense in the sense that, yeah, a black person milling around a parking lot looking at his phone might attract some attention in a particularly racist town. But it was still like, okay, why is Pokemon Go in this? Like, I well, guess. Hey, sometimes you want to like catch, you want to catch the news, or or em all in this case. Yeah, it, no, yeah, catch them all refers to uh, shoehorning the new clumsily shoehorning the news into your article so you can get those clicks. You got to catch all the headlines. And it's amazing though this this article you're talking about though. Because it's what should happen next. Pride should announce that the police services can and are encouraged to continue to play an active role as participants in all Pride events. I don't think they don't think they were allowed in because Black Lives Matter was in there. It wasn't like it was... There's a picture of the sign. It doesn't... It says Black Lives Matter Toronto 2016 Honoured Group. So I assume there's an honoured group every year. And so... well, But also, it didn't say, like, die pigs or, like, no cops allowed. No, it didn't say that at all. No. You know? <laughs> in fact, I, in fact, I'm sure if you asked them, they wouldn't be like "fuck you, cop." It would just they just be like okay. Yeah, that's not that's not a big political position that like w- wanting to murder police. Yeah. He's like he's like doing he's like this is like what baseball crank thinks. Baseball <laughs> crank thinks that like Black Lives Matter. They're protesting cops being alive. And this is literally the the opposite of things I know about being like a white guy in Oakland, but like. It's like, I just thinking about it for a second, it's just, I'm pretty sure that if the police stopped fucking shooting black people for like no reason, that black people would be okay with the police because that's literally what, like, no one's saying, okay, there's probably someone who said like, kill all cops. I'm sure. I'm sorry. Well, like, law of average, law of averages, yeah. Law of averages, yeah. Like, there's probably a person who said that, but there are more, I mean, and this is kind of like the root of the problem, isn't it? There's statistically a way higher significant number of cops who are like, fuck black people than black people who are like, I want to kill cops. Like, if you put those two numbers side by side, not only does one have a greater amount of power in society, but it's also a very much higher number. Well, I'm going to write my blog, shame on the police parade for including gay people. Because you know what? It really just gets in the way of police. Yeah, no, I was trying to have a cop time. I was trying to have a good good, good time with the cops. And then someone had to gay it up. <laughs> and it's, just, it's just like this. And what's great as well is they're in honored positions. So naturally you can find out who's honored here. And you've got someone called Salah Bashir, who's a, he is a... Um, he is a something called he's the president of Cineplex Media and publisher of Cineplex Movie Magazines and honestly I just wish cinema would stop getting in the way of gay pride yeah like Jesus this is not about movies you fucking asshole cut it out yeah it's just sickening when I see movies using the hijacking the pride agenda to talk about entertainment I just think it's sickening. It just do, and now there's this thing called the prancing elites dancing in Pride. How am I meant to pay attention to the issues of gay rights when there's people dancing? Oh my god, guys! I'm gonna give you two two do betters for this one. <laughs> yeah, fifteen points from Gryffindor. All right, <laughs> fuck this. <laughs> fuck everything. Jesus Christ! What a bad fucking article. <laughs> I, it's just like it's just and what's worse is like he's hurting his own agenda as well like he, I don't know what his agenda is other than just being annoyed at shitty things like just just being yo un- you gotta get those articles out his agenda is get those motherfucking articles out gotta write that article anything happens you gotta write that motherfucking article react or die that's it yeah, it's, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> holy shit I wish, like, I, I feel like, you know, I I feel like uh, a lot of, to circle back around, to call back to what we started out with, that these fucking think piece outfits, they're like sweat, they're like writing sweatshops. Yeah. Like, guy's whipping them, and he's like, no, talk about your eating disorder. <laughs> talk whip. about Tinder. <laughs> it's, it's a CIA black ops thing. Yeah. Where it's just like, they've got them in a, in a place, they've got their families. But this one, this one is like, James, we need a tank. <laughs> oh, I'm on it, but it's like no, it's like the beginning of Blade Runner. We need the old magic back. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> and his inner monologue's like, hmm, huh, how could I, uh, how could I uh, really shit this up? And there's just, it's, it's just, I just don't even know. It, it's just, and there's even a response letter that I'll just read the, uh, the, the sentence that is more intelligent than the entire article. Your editorial claim that Black Lives Matter's 30 minute action was damaging to pride in that it eclipsed the almost, also important conversation about LGBT. BT writes, eclipse something is to block it out. Done. That person is right. That person just beat you with a sentence. Well, two sentences, technically. Your shitty blog is dead. They've won. Yeah. Yeah, no more blog, bitch. <laughs> Slam dunk. And I think the, there's one issue we have to discuss, though, to close off the podcast. And I'm so sorry to hear this, by the way, Felix. And also, I guess we should probably call our attorneys about Theranos. Oh uh, yeah, guys, we we are without a sponsor now. Uh, and you're without a wife. I'm without a wife. I usually only one bad thing happens to me at once. But, yeah. Uh, well, not only has my wife left me, but she is banned from working in a laboratory for five years. So, no more alimony for me. It's just really sad to hear that the completely well mostly fake blood startup is being banned from science and to really close it off it really is the soul of the scumbag as well to see that Ther- that elizabeth holmes i think she was banned for two years or five years i can't remember off the top of my head from blood startups it is the perfect circle and we could probably do three hours of just reading tweets of people over time defending her but I'm so sorry about your wife, Felix, and her being banned for literally lying, like, for, like, a decade. Well, the nice thing about being Polly is it's only <laughs> one less po- partner, but it doesn't make it hurt any less. Also, you kind of need, like, one more than... Yeah, no, I, 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 need, I need to retain uh, balance. This is why I'm Volcel. It takes the whole, whole problem away of, like, being made fun of for not having sex when you make that decision yourself. <sighs> I might be joining you after this whole episode. I might be joining you in Wall Seldom. And that's how we're going to close off episode six, everyone. Thank you so much for listening. Subscribe on iTunes, on Sound, SoundCloud. You, we you, just got a Fuckler page. I want you to subscribe <laughs> on Fuckler. On and Fuckler Tumblr. and Gunt as well. Yeah, Gunt's a big one. <laughs> Minority Mapper. All, and, of, all the apps. And, of course, um, uh, there is uh, the, the Racist Podcast Dictionary. I think they just got published by uh, Racist Publishers. Uh, it's a subsidiary of Penguin. Follow me on Racist Genius. <laughs> All right, everyone. Thanks for listening. I'm Ed Zitron. I'm Felix Biederman. This has been The Scumbag. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>